Hello. Recording. I'm going to share my screen. So you should be seeing my screen now. Uh, huh. Let's see. Um, today is August 19th, and we should be finishing the lesson on viruses and viroids and then starting the lesson on chapter 14. There is no lab today. However, at 6.30, I am going to log on and talk a half an hour uh, for the lesson, because I don't think we're going to get very far in chapter 14, if we even get into chapter 14 today. So I'm going to take at least a half an hour of uh, the lab and lecture time to go over the lecture. And I mentioned I was going to be doing that because in the summer, they truncate the uh, class from 10 weeks to eight weeks. And normally in the summer, they increase the time of the lecture and the lab. They did increase the time of the lab, but for some reason, they did not increase the time of the lecture. And I need a little bit more time because we don't have two weeks. Any questions about any of that? So I will be uh, giving a little bit of lecture in the lab time today. Um, let's see. The question was about what is the final going to cover? Uh, it is comprehensive, but at least 50% of the material will be covering the material since the last quiz. Our last quiz covered chapter eight and lab nine. And that means 50% of the questions will come from chapters 13 and chapter 14. And I'll have to check the final to make sure there's no chapter seven. In the summer, I give students a break. And that is we do not have a lesson on chapter seven. There will be some questions from the lab but less than 10%, and it won't be any specific lab number it's coming from. Although there will be a few questions from the uh, unknown project. So know how to use the table and looking up when you have information about an organism that's causing disease to be able to figure out what the organism is. And that's pretty similar to your unknown report, as well as the case studies you've been working on. Any question about that part? All right, so it is a comprehensive exam. So there will be questions from every chapter. It's just that there will be a lot more questions from chapter 13 and 14. So if you're reviewing, First review chapters 13 and chapter 14. And then as time allows, review chapters one through chapter eight, skipping chapter seven. And review the labs, lab zero to lab nine. Uh, with the labs, you should know the important terms and what you did in the labs. Any question about any of that? Most of the questions will be multiple choice. Um, if you want to know how many questions, I think it's about 50. Let me uh, shut this down and I'll confirm that. Oh, let me see. Stop the share. Hmm, it didn't work. There we go. So you're not seeing my screen, correct? Correct. OK. Let me just go into the final and make sure it's about 50 questions. And there are three short answer essay questions. So there will be a final A and a final B. There we go.
Come on. It's worth 135 points, the multiple choice questions. And uh, it'll be up to 150 points when you put on the essay questions. Uh, mm, I don't have the number. Let me, uh, I'm not going to count them, but let me uh, do something else. Uh, how do I do this? Cancel. There are 45 multiple choice questions. Okay. Let's see. Let's go out of there. And then I'm going to share my screen. All right. Any other questions? Oops, not in the meeting. That's the wrong one. Oh, fortunately, I stopped that. Push the wrong button there. I pushed the end the meeting button. There we go. So you should be seeing my screen now. Uh, I think I've already covered the syllabus. So let's go ahead and uh, let me see if this is the one. Oops, lost it. I don't remember which uh, file I have. I got two of these there. That's not right. All right, did we finish talking about multiplication of animal viruses and that they can happen by, by entering the cell by uh, penetration into cytosis? or by fusion of the viral envelope with the cell membrane. This is the last slide we talked about. Hello? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thank you for uh, assisting there. Um, so the multiplication of animal viruses happens similar to bacterial viruses. But there are some differences. Um, and the main one was uh, penetration, and then that the, the, uh, the uh, viruses can uh, multiply in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm. And bacteriophages can only replicate in the cytoplasm because there is no nucleus in it bacteria. Uh, one other change that's a major one that happens with the multiplication of animal viruses is that they can have a different life cycle. With the bacteriophages, they're all following the lytic life cycle or the lysinogenic life cycle. With animal viruses, they can follow the lytic life cycle. There is no lysinogenic life cycle for animal viruses, but there is a budding life cycle and a um, uh, latent life cycle, we'll talk about that in a minute, and a persistent infection life cycle. Any question about any of that? Uh, how the budding life cycle happens, which most animal viruses either follow the lytic life cycle or the budding life cycle. Well, I suppose that they're following the budding life cycle, they can also go into the latent life cycle. And we will talk about the latent life cycle in a few minutes. With the budding life cycle, the animal virus replicates in the cell but it replicates in the cell at low numbers. And so the virus will be shed from the cell without lysing the cell. And generally a budding life cycle virus does not 
kill the host cell it infects. So it will stay in the host cell and over time, but at low numbers, here we're actually seeing a, an electron microscopic image and where we see this little button right there, that's the virus budding out of the cell. And I don't know if that's more than one cell or not because I don't even know what this is a picture of except that it's of alpha virus. But what happens is the virus replicates, meaning it makes a copy of its uh, nucleic acid and its protein coat. And then the two come together and they make close to the final virion. And then that virus comes up to an envelope. This can be the cell membrane, but it could also be the nuclear membrane or the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the virus pushes on the envelope. And by the way, the virus will come up to, let me blow this up a little bit, will come up to a portion of the membrane that has proteins or glycoproteins that are encoded by the virus. And so that's what these uh, blue things are in the membrane proteins or glycoproteins that are encoded by the virus, and the virus will come up to this region of the membrane. And as you notice, this region of the membrane over here doesn't have the viral proteins, and the virus won't come to there, it'll come here. And then it will start pushing on the membrane, causing it to bud, and then forming a real bud, and then it'll rip off a portion of the membrane, and the membrane over here will anneal. So this portion here will anneal with that portion there. And then this portion here around the virus will anneal with this portion here. Okay, you know what I'm talking about, anneal. And then the uh, cell membrane, if that's what it is, or the nuclear membrane or the ER membrane will be functional. And then the uh, virus will rip off a piece of the membrane of the cell. And that's how a budding virus obtains its envelope. All enveloped viruses bud. Any question about that? So if an animal virus has an envelope, it is a budding virus. All right, if there's no questions, I'm going to move further. This slide actually goes over a lot of information. Uh, while we're talking about this, uh, I should mention that if the host cell dies, it's not usually from the budding virus. It would be from the immune system recognizing that this cell is infected with the virus, and the immune system would be the one that would kill this cell. Usually, a budding virus buds at low enough numbers that the uh, loss of the membrane is not significant. So it doesn't do much harm to the cell. Any question about that part? And then I should mention about the persistent life cycle. Uh, these are naked viruses, meaning they do not contain an envelope. So they're animal viruses, but they uh, are shed from the cell uh, at low numbers. And they don't shed by lysing the cell and they don't shed by budding. How they're shed is, is that the virus or several of them, it's put in a vesicle and then the vesicle will either go out of the cell or will merge with the cell membrane and then open up, releasing the virus from the cell. And so the budding life cycle is similar to the persistent infection life cycle. The difference is the budding life cycle viruses are enveloped and the persistent infection 
viruses are naked viruses. Any question about that? All right. So viruses have different genomes. Let's talk a little bit about how they replicate their different genomes. Each virus type needs to have a slightly different mechanism for multiplication of the viral genome and then biosynthesis of the virus. Uh, for double-stranded DNA, it's pretty simple. You just uh, separate each strand of DNA and then use one strand as a template for replicating another new strand of DNA. And that way you get two strands of DNA becoming four. For single-stranded DNA, what you do is you make the complement of the single-strand DNA and then use the complement to make the genomic strand of DNA. Any question about that? Double-stranded RNA actually happens the same as double-stranded DNA. You open up the double-stranded RNA and you use one strand of RNA as a template for making the other strand of RNA. Any questions about that? And then single-stranded RNA works similar to single-stranded DNA. If you have positive single-strand RNA genome, you make the complement, the negative single-strand RNA, and then use that complement to make your genomic single-strand RNA. And it's vice versa if we're talking about a positive single-strand RNA. Any question about any of that part? All right, so let's talk a little bit about the DNA viruses. Let me blow this up. You do not need to memorize this slide, but it is showing you the DNA viruses, the family of viruses that infect humans and cause human diseases. We've already talked a little bit about the pox viridae. That's the virus that causes smallpox and cowpox. Uh, we've talked a little bit about herpes viridae. Those are the herpes viruses, like uh, herpes simplex type 1, chicken pox. I think we talked about some of the other herpes viruses. Uh, we haven't talked about papavirum, papa, no. Viridae or the poly um, viridae. Adenoviridae, I'm just going to briefly mention this is one of the family of viruses that causes the human cold. Adenoviridae is actually the third most common cause of the human cold. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, Coronaviridae is the most common cause of the human cold. And uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, coronavirus. Coronaviridae is the, the uh, second most common cause of the human cold. Adenoviridae also causes human colds, and, and we won't talk much about that, especially if you're in the military. They've got a vaccine for preventing human colds uh, being caused by adenoviridae. And the adenoviridae, for some strange reason, uh, seems to hit military barracks. I assume it's the stress of life in a military barrack. Uh, we're not going to talk about the hepa adenoviridae or the viroviridae. But anyways, uh, these are the DNA family of viruses that cause human diseases, and uh, you don't really need to know the family and whether they're enveloped or double-stranded or single-stranded or even what diseases they cause. But just showing you, there's uh, seven. 
Yeah, seven families. All right, let's do that, move forward. Let's talk a little bit about the herpes. Uh, Viridae. I've already mentioned that uh, DNA containing animal viruses are generally replicated in the nucleus. That's a rule of thumb. But most DNA containing viruses replicate in the nucleus. And they usually use viral enzymes to replicate the DNA. The capsid and the proteins are synthesized in the cytoplasm using the host cell machinery. Once a viral DNA enters the host nucleus, one of two things can happen. Um, you can have the viral DNA integrating into the host chromosome. And this is not called the prophage when this happens because it's not a bacteriophage, it's an animal virus. So we call it a provirus, similar term. And the viral DNA integrates into the chromosome, one of the chromosomes. With animal viruses, if they integrate into the host cell chromosome, the provirus remains permanently in the host cell DNA. It never comes out, and it will remain there for as long as that host cell survives. The provirus will be replicated when the host DNA replicates. Any question about any of that? Uh, animal, uh, humans don't have proviruses in their genome. Actually, we do, but they're mutated and non functional. There's like five or six. Uh, genes in the human genome, uh, viruses, sorry, that are in the human genome, but they are uh, mutated and non-functional. But there are, um, like mice have uh, uh, viruses in the mouse genome, and it'll be passed from parents to offspring, and then the, uh, the uh, baby mice will be infected with the Provirus because it'll be in all their cells because it came from either the egg or the sperm. And uh, usually it's a budding virus. And then uh, when the mouse starts getting older, I'm not sure when it happens, the virus will start budding out of the mouse. Uh, the other thing that can happen when the DNA the virus enters a host cell, the viral DNA can be expressed and the viruses can be replicating, producing new virions. Uh, so the double-stranded DNA will be replicated as a viral double-stranded DNA. The DNA will be transcribed as viral messenger RNA. That will be translated into viral capsid proteins. The viral capsid proteins will get together with the viral uh, genomic DNA to produce new progeny virions. And then that will leave the cell either by, depending on the life cycle, by the budding life cycle, the persistent infection life cycle, or by the lytic life cycle. Let's talk about multiplication of a DNA virus in more detail. Uh, the virus will fuse or bind to the cell membrane. And it can either, if it's an envelope virus, this is a naked virus, I think. Where did I see that? Hmm. I'm not seeing where it was. I thought I saw that it was a naked virus earlier. Um, so, uh, this virus can integrate in the cell by, or penetrate into the cell by endocytosis, or if it's an envelope virus, it can also 
have the envelope fuse with the cell membrane, and then that'll just dump the virus into the uh, cell. And so the virus gets into the cytoplasm. The trouble is it's a DNA virus, so that DNA has to move into the nucleus. Scroll down a little bit. Uh, the nucleus will be, once it gets in the nucleus, it uh, will have its uh, viral DNA transcribed or viral messenger RNA. The messenger RNA will then move into the cytoplasm and start translocating viral proteins. In the meantime, the viral DNA in the nucleus will get replicated. And then the viral DNA will combine with the viral protein to make new virions, which can then be released from the cell in one of three mechanisms. It looks like the picture is showing you the lytic life cycle and the cell is bursting to release the cells but the cell could be releasing the virus as a budding life cycle or by a persistent viral infection, which is similar to budding. And that is the virus will be put in an envelope, in a vesicle, sorry, not in an envelope, but in a vesicle. And then the vesicle will fuse with the cell membrane or, and then release the virus into the environment. All right, any questions about how DNA viruses replicate? If not, let's move on to RNA viruses. And you will note that there are more of them. I think there's 15. Fifteen families of RNA viruses that causes disease in humans. I briefly mentioned the Pocornoviridae. It is the number one cause of human colds, but it also can cause the virus, uh, the disease, sorry, polio, meaning there's a, a virus in this family that causes polio. And then hepatitis A is also in this family. Uh, Calcia viridae, we're not going to talk about. Uh, herpes viridae causes, uh, excuse me, that's not herpes. I need better glasses. Let me blow that up a little bit more. Yep, that's too far. I don't know why I did that. Happy viridae. We won't talk about that. Astro viridae, causing gastroenteritis. Toga viridae. I will briefly mention that because that is the virus that causes rubella. Uh, Flavi viridae, uh, causing yellow fever and hepatitis C. Coronaviridae, we'll talk more about that. That's the coronaviruses. This one, the, the majority of the members of the coronaviridae cause human colds. And the coronaviruses that cause the colds tend to hit children. Adults have already been exposed to the coronaviruses. And so they don't tend to get colds from coronaviruses. But uh, uh, coronaviridae frequently causes colds in children, especially young children. And obviously, it causes severe acute respiratory syndrome like COVID-19 or SARS. Uh, we'll talk more about coronaviridae about three slides. Retroviridae is a, a family that uh, is the retroviruses. And this is a virus that uh, causes AIDS or human immunodeficiency virus. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, for one thing, these are different than the other RNA viruses. Uh, Peromyxidae, Peromyxoviridae is a family of viruses that cause common childhood illnesses like uh, um, 
measles, uh, mumps, it's the third one, um, whooping cough, uh, rhabdoviridae, we're not gonna talk about much, it causes, one of them is rabies, uh, filioviridae, we're not gonna talk about it at all, Orthomixer viridae is one we should talk about. Uh, you probably never heard of that name, but those are the family of viruses that cause the flu. And this family of virus is a little different in the fact that the uh, flu virus or the members of this family tend to change rapidly. They mutate and change rapidly, more so than most other viruses. Um, bunny viruses, the bunny viridae, we're not going to talk about, and reno viridae, we're not going to talk about, and the real viridae, we're not going to talk about. All right, any question about the RNA viruses? Uh, the important thing to realize is a rule of thumb. If it's an RNA virus, the rule of thumb is it replicates in the cytoplasm. Everyone got that? Now there is one exception, the family retroviridae is an RNA virus, but it does not replicate in the cytoplasm. It replicates in the nucleus. So that's the one exception. Any questions about that? All right, let's move on. Showing you some RNA viruses. Uh, they do, the RNA viruses do replicate similar to the DNA viruses. Obviously, they have RNA as their genome. Uh, I've already mentioned this the positive strand, single strand RNA animal viruses. We make the negative strand and then use the negative strand to replicate more of the positive genomic strand. And then vice versa, if you're a negative strand virus, you make the positive strand, and then you use the positive strand to make more of your genomic strand RNA. Any question about any of that? And this slide is showing you how uh, replication can happen sort of right there the RNA viruses, the negative strand makes the positive strand to make more negative strand, the positive strand makes the negative strand to make more positive strand. Only the positive strand of the virus can be read by the ribosome and then translated into protein. So if you're a DNA virus, you make messenger RNA, and that'll be positive strand RNA. If you're a genomic positive strand RNA, virus, you can use that strand to be translated. If you're a negative strand genome RNA virus, you have to make the positive strand RNA virus to make the proteins. Any question about any of that? All right, I've already talked about that, so I'm going to move on. So let's go on how an RNA family virus multiplies. If it is a double strand RNA virus, you just replicate one strand from the other. You, you use one strand as a template to make your second strand. For a positive sense strand RNA virus, the uh, virus will infect the cell be brought into the cell, into the cytoplasm, and then the uh, positive RNA will make the negative strand RNA, and then use that negative strand RNA to make more of the genomic positive strand RNA virus. And then the positive strand RNA virus will be uh, transcribed, not transcribed, translated, into protein, and then the protein coat of the virus will get together with the positive strand RNA to make the new virions. 
which will then either be shed from the cell by the budding life cycle or the lytic life cycle or by the persistent infection life cycle. Any questions about multiplication of the positive sense strand RNA viruses? All right, if not, let's move on to multiplication of the negative antisense strand RNA virus. So a negative strand RNA virus will fuse with the cell and be brought into the cell. And that happens either by endocytosis uh, or if it's an envelope virus, the envelope can fuse with the cell membrane and dump the virus into the cytoplasm. The negative RNA genome cannot be translated, but it can make the positive RNA strand. And then that can be used to translate the viral proteins. And then the positive strand RNA will be used as a template for making more of the genomic strand which is the negative strand. And then the negative strand RNA will get together with the viral proteins to make the new virions. And then these new virions will be shed from this infected cell uh, by one of three ways. If it's the lytic life cycle, it'll lyse the cell and release a, a number of new virions. If it's the budding life cycle, it will bud out of the cell at low numbers. And then if it's the persistent infection, uh, the virus will be put into a vesicle, which will then fuse with the cell membrane, releasing the virus into the environment. All right, any question about the multiplication of negative strand RNA viruses? Okay, with that stated, let me state that the retroviruses, the retroviridae family, is an exception to the RNA viruses because this is an RNA virus, but it does not replicate in the cytoplasm. The retroviruses includes the lentiviruses, which include HIV-1 and HIV-2, two human viruses that cause the disease AIDS. And another lentivirus is feline leukemia virus, which causes leukemia in cats. And the cats just get sicker and sicker from the leukemia until they waste away, very similar to an AIDS patient. Any question about any of that part? All right. The retroviruses are different because they contain a gene for the enzyme reverse transcriptase. And this protein or enzyme, there is a copy of it in the virus. Oops, not too far. Let's go ahead and blow that up. So there's a retrovirus and there's the envelope and then the protein coat, and there's the viral genome. Right there is a, a little purple glob, and that's reverse transcriptase. And like I said, you find the RNA genome and then the enzyme reverse transcriptase in the virus. Uh, the name retrovirus actually comes from a shortening uh, reverse transcriptase. You use the RE from reverse and the TR from trip transcriptase, and then you put those together and you call it retrovirus. Any question about any of that? Uh, reverse transcriptase is an unusual enzyme because it's an RNA dependent DNA polymerase, which I'm sure means a lot to you. What that does is this enzyme can make DNA from an RNA template. Let me, uh, if you want. Let 
So we have a positive single strand RNA as uh, the genome. And then I don't know how to do this. So RT. Start another line putting the arrows. Come on. Step from. Not drawn very well, but you're getting the point. This should actually be down there. Ah, fudge. That's a little far, but that's all right. So with reverse transcriptase, we first make single strand DNA from uh, the uh, genome, and then the reverse transcriptase. Let me see if I can do that. Reverse transcriptase takes the single strand DNA to make double strands. Oops. Yes. Any question about that? That double strand DNA then moves into the nucleus. Um, And then integrates into the host chromosome. Integrates, did I spell that right? No. Does it integrate? Yep. And this is actually uh, potentially a problem for the person. This is sort of random. Different cells that are infected with uh, retrovirus, the uh, retrovirus will integrate into different positions on different chromosomes. So, in different cells, you get the integration in a different chromosome as well as a different position. And uh, it's like the retrovirus just integrates at random. And then, how does this replicate? Well, you uh, make, transcribe. I should say viral messenger RNA. And then that will go into the cytoplasm and be translated into proteins, especially the protein coat of the virus. And then the uh, double-stranded DNA. Oops. No, it's not. No, I didn't. And we're talking about the viral double-stranded DNA. Um, can be transcribed. As a viral positive single strand RNA. And that's genomic RNA. And then the protein and the uh, genome can get together to make new viruses. Questions about that? And 
how does this replicate? How does that get out of the cell? Anyone recall? How does a retrovirus leave a cell? It's only one of three possibilities. Is it the lytic life cycle? Is it the budding life cycle? Nobody's going to guess. Uh, retroviruses bud, so they follow the budding life cycle. Anyway, any question? All right. Any questions about reverse transcriptase or uh, retroviral replication? You can see why retroviruses are an exception for the RNA family of viruses. And that is they are an RNA virus, but they have a DNA intermediate. And by the way, if the cell is infected with the retrovirus, for as long as that cell is alive, you will have in its chromosome, the retrovirus. Why once a patient um, gets over HIV, an HIV infection, uh, they may have HIV in one or a few of their cells, and it's just in their genome uh, hiding out. And so even though it looks like the patient is, is uh, cured, uh, the HIV could come back on them because like I said, it does integrate into their cells and it then remains there for as long as that cell is alive. Usually HIV, well, it's not entirely true. HIV mostly, we'll word it that way, does not kill the cell. Uh, HIV is an exception and that is especially in AIDS, there can be so much virus budding uh, out of a T helper cell that you can kill the T helper cell because the cell is losing too much membrane. But usually, uh, even HIV, or at least most of the time, does not kill the cell. How the cell dies is because the immune system recognizes that cell is infected with the virus and the uh, immune system attacks that cell and kills it, trying to get rid of the virus. But if the virus is in the chromosome, it can stay there for the lifetime of that cell and then just sort of hide there, especially if it's not uh, active, actively replicating. Any question about any of that? I think I've discussed retroviruses. This picture is showing you, let me blow it up. A retrovirus is infected the cell, it's brought into the cell. The uh, viral RNA is made from reverse transcriptase, first into single strand DNA and then into double strand DNA. The double strand then moves into the nucleus and then integrates into a chromosome of a person, and that we call a provirus because it has the, the uh, viral genome in the host DNA. And then that host DNA can make uh, RNA, and that'll be positive strand RNA. The positive strand RNA can be translated into proteins in the cytoplasm. And then the positive strand RNA is the, the uh, genome of the virus. So we can get together with the uh, the protein coat, make the virus, and then the virus will bud out of the uh, cell. Any question about that? All right, if not, that's it for uh, retroviruses. Uh, we spent about three or four slides talking about them because they're a unique family of RNA viruses. 
And they are the one exception to the RNA family that doesn't follow the rule of thumb. And that is it doesn't replicate in the cytoplasm. This one replicates in the nucleus. Uh, the other the RNA family of viruses I wanna talk about are coronaviruses. And it should be obvious to you why I'm gonna talk about that because we're currently under a pandemic of a coronavirus infection in the world. And do you notice this picture? This is the picture that uh, I chose for my microbiology class at Clark years and years ago, long before there was ever uh, COVID-19. And it just as I thought a cool picture of a virus. And this is a virus that causes human colds but it is in the family coronaviruses. And now it's very appropriate because it's also what the COVID-19 virus looks like. Uh, coronaviruses are single positive strand RNA viruses. They're enveloped, that's what that is there with spikes. And I mentioned earlier that coronaviruses are the second most common cause of the colds especially giving colds in human children. Uh, coronaviruses also cause SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. These three are similar in that they give severe acute respiratory syndrome, what SARS stands for. Um, middle, uh, MERS stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And COVID-19 can also give a respiratory syndrome. A MERS has the highest mortality rate, about 36% of the people who become infected with MERS die. But fortunately, MERS does not spread from person to person. Most of the people who come down with MERS are spending a lot of time with camels. And if you don't know, camels aren't very common in the United States and I should say close contact with camels, like it's camel riders and maybe camel breeders, I don't know. Um, but apparently camels have this virus and it can cross from the camel to the people and then give the person the MERS. And it's highly lethal, but fortunately MERS doesn't spread person to person. Uh, SARS is a disease that started in 2003 and I'm trying to remember, it came back one year in China, but I don't remember when that was, when it came back. It's more lethal than, than COVID-19. So let's say five to 10% lethal, but uh, less lethal than COVID-19. COVID-19 uh, has an estimated mortality rate uh, between 0.2% and 3%. And you should know it spreads more easily than the flu. And the last I checked, because this number changes all the time, uh, if one person is infected, they're likely to infect one to 2.5 other people. And that's why COVID-19 has continued to flourish on the planet Earth, because when one person gets infected, he infects at least one other person, maybe as much as 2.5 other people. And if you don't know, COVID-19 is blooming because the Delta variant is even more contagious than I think the Alpha variant or whatever the earlier COVID-19 variants were. And uh, so it's even more infectious. And it's spreading very well, at least in the United States in the summer, especially in the summer of the southern states. And this virus, let me tell you, does not like the heat of the summer or the UV light of our summer sun. Meaning UV light can quickly kill this virus. If you want to sterilize something that may have been exposed to COVID-19 and it just has a surface, just put it in the sun. 15 minutes would be more than enough to kill all COVID-19, uh, at least in the summer. And uh, 
He doesn't like the temperature of the summer either. So I'm afraid this winter, you can expect the COVID-19 will be doing quite well because there will be less UV light and it'll be a cooler temperature. The COVID-19 will live longer in cooler temperatures. So it is a virus that normally would tend to spread in the cooler weather, like the late fall and the winter and the early spring. But because it spreads so easily from person to person, it is spreading very well in the summer. Okay, any question about any of that? COVID-19 is closely related to bat coronaviruses. It likely originated from bat coronaviruses. Uh, COVID-19 is actually a recombination of three viruses, two bat viruses, coronaviruses, uh, recombine, and they combine with a pangolin virus. If you don't know what pangolin is, it's a spiny anteater. And the pangolin part only is about 10% of the genome and it's coding the spikes on the coronavirus. So this virus probably recombined in fairly recent times, you know, the last 10 or 20 years, and then was passed probably in bats for a while. It may have been only passed uh, two or three years. We don't know how long it's been around, but it's probably recent. And uh, uh, it had to get together with the pangolin virus at some point and then recombine with that. And then it uh, lived in an intermediate, probably a pangolin, meaning a spiny anteater, before it was introduced into humans. What they think happened, and obviously we don't know for sure, is that the virus replicated, recombined, and then was replicating in bats, and then got into a pangolin as an intermediate. And then this pangolin was probably brought into uh, the Chinese food market in uh, Wuhan, China. Uh, in China, they uh, have a lot of these exotic animals that they bring to the food markets and then sell them and people for some reason like to eat them. Personally, I've never eaten an anteater and it doesn't sound too appetizing to me, but uh, apparently it was a uh, delicacy in China and somebody got the virus. Probably the person who bought the pangolin or the person who was selling the pangolin. And actually China has noticed now that three times in the last, let's see, 20 years, 2003, 2021, so less than 20 years, we've had a severe viral infection that came out of the animal meat markets in China. So China has said, geez, we got SARS twice, and now we got COVID-19. Maybe we shouldn't have all these exotic animals in the meat market, because it looks like uh, these meat markets are a good place for an animal virus to be brought into China and then move from the animal to the person. And then once COVID-19 moved to the person, it started spreading among people. Any questions about any of that? And then the controls that were put in place did not stop COVID-19 because a large number of patients who get COVID-19 are asymptomatic. They'll never know they're infected and carrying COVID-19. And that is actually how it was probably introduced into this country because they know the few people who came from China who had COVID-19, they went into quarantine. But the virus continued to spread in the United States and probably it was brought into this country by someone who was asymptomatic. And then it started spreading, at first asymptomatic. And uh, when we're talking about young people, 
we're talking about children and people in their 20s, maybe low 30s, about half of the patients will be asymptomatic. And it's believed that of all patients who become infected with COVID-19, about a third of the patients in the United States will be asymptomatic. They'll never know they're sick and they'll never know that they're uh, shedding COVID-19 unless they get the COVID-19 test. Any question about any of that? Uh, the transmission of COVID-19 is primarily via droplets from coughs or sneezes within a range of six feet, but you can get it from talking. You can get it especially from singing. Uh, singing seems to be just as well as a cough or a sneeze is uh, spreading COVID-19. Um, you can get COVID-19 from a surface. So somebody can cough or sneeze on a surface and then you can pick it up like on your hands and then inoculate your mucous membrane. However, COVID-19 is mostly breathed in it rarely is picked up from the hands and then carried to the face. It can be transmitted that way, which is surprising that there aren't more cases of COVID-19 which we pick up on our hands and then inoculate. Because if you don't know with colds and flus, most of the cases we pick those viruses up on our hands and then we inoculate uh, one of the mucous membranes in our faces by either touching the eye or the nose or the mouth, something like that. Uh, COVID-19 can survive on plastic for three days or some metal surfaces for three days, but on paper and cardboard, it will only live for a day. So something you wanna do if you're worried is when you get your mail, uh, sanitize your hand or wash your hands after touching the mail and let it sit for a day at least a day at room temperature, and then that'll kill it. You wanna kill it faster, put it out in the sun, and uh, uh, just, you're gonna to have to flip it over, obviously, but uh, put it out in the sun for 15 minutes and flip it over, and that should kill the virus. I like to flip it twice just to make sure, and then obviously you gotta to touch it, and, and uh, you could pick up from the other backside of a, one envelope and then touch it on the other side. So I flip them twice. Are the symptoms of COVID-19? It's mostly flu-like, although uh, the runny nose and the sneezing are less commonly seen than you have in the flu. And then the shortness of breath and the deaths are more common with COVID-19 than you see in the flu. The mortality rate of COVID-19 increases with the age of the patient, with the ill health of the patient. COVID-19 is more lethal in men than in women, and it's more lethal in Blacks and Hispanics than it is in whites and Asians. Uh, nobody has ever explained why Blacks and Hispanics seem to be a greater risk of COVID-19 but that's just the way it is. And it's not just in the United States that this is seen. Uh, like the lethality rate in Mexico is one of the highest in the world. And it's definitely higher than the United States. But also when we look at the populations, uh, Hispanics in the United States are more likely to die than whites and Asians. And if you look at Hispanics in Canada, they're more likely to die as well. So it's not just something particular to the United States. It is something that Blacks and Hispanics appear to be more susceptible to COVID-19 than whites and Asians. And I don't know why that's the case. Nobody knows that I know of. The incubation period, when you first are exposed to COVID-19, you will uh, be incubating the virus for two to 14 days before you'll have any sign of uh, signs or symptoms. 
However, remember that in the United States, about a third of the people who become infected with COVID-19 will be asymptomatic. So they'll never develop signs of disease. The estimated death rate is between 0.2% to 3% of patients who become infected with COVID-19 will die. Uh, the last I looked, and this is uh, May 29th, 2001, the death rate in the United States was 1.8% of the people who became infected with COVID-19 died. The best ways to prevent getting infected with COVID-19 are to wash your hands frequently, to use correct hand washing, meaning wash your hands for at least 20 seconds, 30 seconds even better. Keep distance from people, stay six feet away. Uh, avoid people who are coughing. Avoid touching one's face because if you get it on your hand, you'll inoculate it into your face. Wear a mask. And if you're sick, definitely wear a mask and best to stay home. Cough into your tissue or your elbow. All right, any questions about any of that? If not, that's it for COVID-19. I'm going to uh, come back during the lecture in the lab here. We're after six o'clock. So I'm gonna stop right here. And then I will continue with this lesson at 6.30, okay? So I'll see you at 6.30 if there's no questions.